This is the Getting Started with GameLift series. In this episode, we're going to take a deeper look at fleet configuration and what options might exist as a best fit for your specific needs. Let's get to it. And we're back with Getting Started with Amazon Game Lift. I am Derek, and with me today is Al. So in our last segment, we initialized our first fleet with kind of our, our minimum viable product. But there are a lot of use cases where we might want to choose a different instance type or different launch parameters. So can we talk a little bit, Al, about in what situations we might want to choose a, a larger instance or change our parameters, things like that? Yes, yes, of course. So, uh, I mean, the, the probably the main thing that uh, customers ask us is, well, which instance type should we use? And the, there's, a, there's a, a fair number of them here, uh, different sorts. And really, it depends on how compute intensive the server is. If you have a more compute intensive server, then you may need a larger instance. Also, you, we're going to select a number of concurrent processors. So how many processors or how many servers are running concurrently on this instance? So if we use a smaller machine like the C4 Large, we might have fewer concurrent processors. But if we were to use some of these very large instances like the, uh, like the M4 10X Large or, 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 or other large instances, then this number of concurrent processors could be quite a lot higher. There's uh, some other things we need to decide as well. So the first is, is this fleet going to be an on-demand on or spot type fleet? And uh, what, so the, the spot instances basically are uh, free instances in the pool of, uh, of, of EC2 that are being unused at the present time. And uh, we can claim those back at any time we like mm -hmm. uh, as part of the agreement. But you can use them because we have uh, a, a predictive algorithm called Fleet IQ that uh, allows us to use spot instances when they're available, but use on-demand instances when they're not. And that way you don't get terminations uh, of, of game sessions due to spot interruptions. So we'll talk about that in another video, but uh, at the same time, that's, this is going to be something you're going to want to set up. Um, another thing that we may want to uh, consider is for each instance, if you have a lot of servers on the instance, so a lot of concurrent processors, what we'll find is when the instance starts, a lot of all these sessions will rush to start at once. But if you also have many games recycling, you know, a game session ends, it recycles, mm -hmm. it goes back to the beginning of the game, and that can be more computationally expensive than the uh, normal gameplay of the game. So we can limit how many uh, of those uh, occurring at any given time. Uh, so maybe there are two uh, game session activations permitted. Well, there may be 10, 10 running, something like that. So in this gotcha. case, you don't get all 10 of these uh, game sessions reactivating at the same time, which would then use enough processor to, to affect other, other players in other games. Gotcha. Another one is we may want to uh, say how long the timeouts are between, um, between the gameplay activations. So uh, the one more thing which we're going to think about here is are we going to protect the players against, um, against scaling rules? Or are we going to allow, or are we going to allow sessions to be terminated? So when you're doing development, it makes the most sense to have uh, the protection set to no protection. That way, if you wanted to just manually scale down, then uh, the fleet will be able to do that. But on a live server, you really would want uh, full protection as the as the players you they're playing real games. They don't want to be interrupted for any reason. Uh, one other thing that uh, we can mention here is it, as well as opening the port for um, the uh, listening um, of the server, which that would be something like this, that uh, that allows us to um, that allows us to open individual ports. Mm -hmm. We might have more than uh, if we let's say we have ten processors here, we might have more than one port. So let's edit that. So there'll be now a port range, and I'm just making this up. Um, so now there's um, now there's uh, fully 
uh, is that right? Fully 10 ports mm -hmm. open there. Um, also, if we wanted to use, our, uh, in the case of Windows, RD, um, RDP, the remote desktop protocol, to debug our servers as they're on the running EC2 instances, we can open up this port, uh, 3389 on TCP, uh, to maybe one particular instance, uh, one particular IP address, let's say that this is my IP address, 1.2.3.4, just made that one up as well. Then now that opens that particular port just to me or to my the range of uh, range of IP addresses gotcha. available to my corporate office, and then uh, we can debug the uh, debug the servers um, at that point. If we're going to use uh, a Linux instance, we're going to use SSH to do that, and that's mm -hmm. port 22 instead. But again, don't under any circumstances open those two ports to the full to to the entire world. Right, right. And there we go. That's everything you need to know about how to select instances, uh, the uh, concurrent processor setting, how to regulate the number of processors recycling, which ports you can open and why, and whether to use protection or not. Excellent. Well, that seems very, very flexible in terms of how we can apply these fleet configurations in order to, to best utilize the game lift service for our, for our uh, multiplayer games. So I would like to, to talk a, a little bit more about uh, some more of the, the features of game lift, uh, but we're gonna uh, go ahead and end this segment here and uh, we'll be right back with some more content for you. So stick around. Thanks for watching. If you like this series, leave a comment below and hit that like button. Also, make sure to subscribe to the channel to get the latest updates.